right, we're in uh, Luke in chapter 10 tonight. We're going to begin chapter 10, and uh, probably going to take, we'll probably finish up chapter 10 next week. There's 42 verses, I believe, in chapter 10 of the Gospel of Luke. Um, I've kind of broken it down into two separate sections. The first, first section carrying us through roughly around verse uh, 22. And then the second section carrying us from verse 23 on uh, through the remainder of the chapter. Um, we see here something actually through verse 20 tonight, and we'll, we'll pick up on verse 22 next week, or verse 21 rather next week. Luke records for us the sending out of the 70. Luke is the only gospel that records this incident. Uh, we know that Jesus sent the 12 out two by two. He sent them in a Galilee to prepare the way for him. The 70 that he sends out, he gives them much of the same instruction. However, they go to the different cities and uh, different, way, uh, different places uh, to prepare. Jesus gives them the same, much of the same power that he's given the apostles or the disciples. Uh, however, and one thing that we'll notice is that with the 70, he didn't necessarily give them the power to cast out demons, but they found some success at it. Um, I say some success. Their report when they came back to report back to Jesus all the things that they had seen and all the things that they'd experienced and done, they told him that even the demons... Even the demons were subject to them through his name. Now, it's important for us to, to think about this for a moment. God has given us the Great Commission to go out and to fulfill that we might present the gospel to a lost world. Many people refuse. I mean, let's, let's just face it. Many of us, and me at times, have either overlooked or have just simply outright refused to go and to do what God has called us to do. A lot of times it's because fear of rejection. Many years ago, I had a deacon to uh, catch me one Sunday morning. He said, preacher, he said, don't call on me to pray. I said, well, okay. I said, you do pray, don't you? Oh, yeah, I pray. I just can't pray in public. A lot of it was a lack of confidence on his part. Uh, he was not highly educated. He was afraid that he would stumble. He was afraid that people perhaps would make fun of him. But all of it boiled down perhaps to pride. Jesus told the 70, and he gave them some encouragement in the fact that he told them that when you come and you present the gospel to people and they reject you, that they're not rejecting you, that they're rejecting me and they're rejecting the one who sent me. So ultimately, that should serve as encouragement to us, and we need to be careful about this. I know that in years past, we've, Baptists especially, have played a numbers game. We considered success when we could uh, lead someone in a prayer, lead someone down the aisle, or lead someone into the baptistry. We need to be careful that we don't puff ourselves up with numbers. Uh, you know, I don't know how many times, how many years that I've heard through Southern Baptist circles that, uh, well, our baptismal numbers are down. We've got to get our baptismal numbers up. Or, or um, other such things such as that. They're more considered with statistics and numbers than they are with souls a lot of times. Or, or we are. We are. Let's face it, in the society in which we live, success is measured by numbers. It's measured by dollars. Uh, it's measured by head count. It's measured, but we need to think about this, that the success that we have can only come through the power of Jesus' name. Um, I told one of our leaders, one of our state convention leaders here several years ago, he was telling me about this new thing that uh, they were going to present before the the state convention and all, and, and I looked him in the face and I said, listen, the local church does not need any more programs. We don't need any more programs. 
a step-by-step -step of how to do this. What we need is we need people to get up off their pews, off their seats, and simply do what Christ has commanded us to do, to share the gospel. Now, when Jesus, and let's begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 10. And after these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place, whether he himself would come. Now, the after these things that, that we begin with in chapter 10, it's following what Jesus uh or what Jesus has described for us or explained to us about the difficulty and the hardships and uh, the unwillingness of some people to give up everything in this world and simply to follow Christ, to put him first and foremost in front of their every step. We talked about that last week, how there was one man came to him and said, well, you know, I'll follow you, but let me first go back and bury my father. Another came to him and said, I'll follow you, but let me first go do this. And then a third, I'll follow you, but let me first go do this. And Jesus said this in Luke in chapter 9, verse 62. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus sent the twelve out two by two. Now he commissions another 70 to go out two by two. He's not looking for excuses. He's simply looking for obedience. And so it says in verse 2, Therefore said he unto them, The harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Now, we, I want to point out just a few things in this passage. First of all, Jesus calls these people. He commissions these people. Secondly, he instructs these people. As I said a little earlier in the opening, that Jesus gave the 70 almost exactly the same instructions that he had given to the 12 that he had sent out previously. But he begins with the first instruction to the 70. He says, we need to be praying. You need to be praying. He looks out, and think about this for a moment. A farmer who has a bumper crop. And he looks out into the fields and he sees the crop ready to harvest. But then he looks around and there are no laborers together, together in the harvest. This must be heartbreaking to God each and every day that we know that there's a harvest waiting. That there are people out there that need to hear the gospel, that people out there who need to be saved. But Jesus tells the 70, first of all, you need to pray. And you need to pray to the Lord of the harvest. It's not our harvest. It belongs to the Lord. And what are we to pray? That he would send forth laborers into his harvest. We need to be, we need to be mindful. The New Testament church, I, I think that probably one of the, the things that we lack the most these days, one of the arts that we have forsaken is the art of prayer. In verse 3, he says, Go your ways. Behold, I send you as lambs among wolves. Now, I want you to notice this, the first three words of verse 3. Go your ways. Jesus has just told them, listen, you need to bathe this matter in prayer. The harvest is ripe, it's ready. You need to pray that the Lord would send, send forth laborers into his harvest. And by the way, you go. One commentary puts it this way, that Jesus, in essence, is telling them to put feet to their prayers. Now, that's not an exact quote. Be saying, listen, you need to pray. You need to bathe the matter in prayer, but then you need to go. In the second part of verse 3, he says, Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Now, that would be kind of discouraging or disheartening in our mindset. Uh, 
Jesus wasn't trying, wasn't trying to discourage them. Jesus wanted them to understand that as they went forth, they would go forth with the gospel of the kingdom of God, which is peace, which is kindness, which is mercy, which is grace. But there would be those out there that ultimately that would reject the message. They would reject the, the messenger. They would reject the one from whom the message came. One commentary said that this would be an encouraging statement because lambs flock together for the most part and therefore they would outnumber the wolves. Now, I can't see that in this passage. But if you notice what Jesus continues to, to do, remember he commissions them, he gives them instructions, and he, we're going to continue on with some instructions. But then he says, you go. And he says in verse 4, carry neither purse nor script nor shoes and salute no man by the way. Jesus said, don't worry about it. And he told the, the disciples the same thing. Don't even carry an extra cloak or coat, he had told the twelve. He's saying, I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. And by the way, you're going to have to learn to trust God for every little detail of your provision. You know, I'm a, an overachiever, I guess, sometimes when it comes to packing. When I'm going on a long trip or when I'm going to the hunting woods or uh, there's some in this church that could attest to that. That I, I, you know, when I go to the woods, you know, I, my dad's always told me never go into the woods without a compass and matches. I always have a compass and matches. I've learned also through the years that you don't go into the woods without some corona protection. So I take a roll of toilet paper with me. And if I'm going on a long trip, or like Sue and I and John and Brendan and I have gone on trips to Colorado where we've taken our side-by-sides up over the mountain. John, when I first, I'm going to and, go ahead and rat on you, John. The first year that we went, I had a big plastic toad. And in that toad, I had a sleeping bag, a tarp. I had a propane heater. I had a hatchet. I had some kindling. I had, uh, what else do I have in there, Sue? I had some raincoats. And John said, you realize that that's going to put more weight on your machine. It's going to cause you to burn more fuel. I said, that's okay. <laughs> I'll buy the gas. Jesus tells these 70s, he sends them out. You don't take anything that will impede your progress or that will hinder your speed. Now, I want you to notice this. Jesus not only sees the necessity, or he wants them to see the necessity of going out, but he also wants them to see the urgency. The urgency. Think about this, folks. How many of you believe Jesus is coming soon? There should be a sense of urgency in our lives to share the kingdom of God with those who are lost. If we truly believe that Jesus could come in any moment, there should be an, a, a sense of urgency. He says in verse 5 and 6, actually verse 5, 6, and 7, And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. Three things we find in these passages in these three verses. First of all, a common greeting, but a blessing ultimately upon the house that received these 70 as they were sent out two by two. 
One commentary says that oftentimes, in, in days of old, that oftentimes these same places that would, that would accept travelers into their homes were places of prostitution and, and immorality. And whether that's true or not, in this, in this instance, I can't say. But Jesus said, ultimately, if they were received into a home, that they were to pronounce a blessing upon that home. Upon all of those who, who tarried or who abided in that place. In verse 6, he says, And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. This Son of Peace that it's referring to, in verse 6, ultimately is a spirit of peace. A spirit of peace. Not a spirit of wickedness, not a spirit of rejection, not a spirit of opposition, but a spirit of peace. What Jesus was saying, listen, you've got to not only trust God with your provisional daily needs, but you've also got to trust God for a place for you to reside. Ultimately, you're not going to be rejected of all men. That there will be some that are going to accept you. Now, we know that when the twelve were sent out, that they were expected, also they were expecting to see much rejection. They were, going into, they were going into the region of Galilee. And there were many who rejected their message. There were many who rejected ultimately Christ's message. Uh, and we're going to name some of those here in just a moment. But Jesus said there is going to be a place. There is going to be a place that's prepared for you beforehand. And there's going to be a spirit of peace in that place. And you stay there at that house. And you eat those things and you drink those things that are provided to you without complaining. Don't you go moving from place to place. Jesus wanted them to abide where their spirit of peace was. He wanted them to understand that God would provide the basic provisional needs that they would have. And he would do that through other individuals. He says in verse 8, it's kind of a transition, but he begins to talk about a city or cities. He said, And into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you, and heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. Jesus gave these 70 some of the same power that he had given the, the 12. He gave them power to heal diseases. Ultimately, this would serve as a physical or eyewitness account of the power of God at work in the lives of people. But they were to also to announce this to those people who were healed. The New King James Version says that Jesus told them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. King James Version says, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. What he wanted them to do was to associate the power of God with the power of salvation, the power of healing. It would not be at the hand of some Sorcerer, it would not be at the hand of some magician, but it would be at the hand of God through the feet of his messengers. He says in verse, not, verse 10, But into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you not, go your ways out into the streets of the same, and say, Even the very dust of your city which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you, notwithstanding, be sure of this. Now I want to stop right there for just a minute. We're going to talk about what they were to be sure of. Once again, Jesus gives them the same instructions that he'd given the disciples to shake the dust off their feet, but they were to verbalize it. They were to verbalize it. This was to ultimately to serve as the ultimate insult against these people who rejected Christ. They were to know that the gospel of peace had come and they had rejected it. In the last part of that verse, I stopped. He tells them to continue to tell them, 
Notwithstanding, be sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. They were to know, they were to know, they ultimately were to recognize, to realize the fact that the gospel of peace and the kingdom of God had been, had entered into their city. But instead, in return, in return of peace for peace, there would be rejection for peace, a rejection of peace. He says in verse 12, But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Sodom was probably one of the most immoral places on this earth at the time. We all know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. We know how Lot was led out of Sodom. We know how Sodom ultimately was destroyed, as well as Gomorrah. But Jesus tells them this, and I want to, I never realized this until I began to really dig deep into these, these verses, these passages. There are many who will receive judgment. But this verse points out the fact that there will be some who will receive worse judgment than others. Those who receive judgment will all spend an eternity in hell, but some of them will, it, for some of them it will be a little bit more hellish than for others. He says in verse 13, Woe unto the Chorazin! Woe unto the Bethsaida! For if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which have been done in you, they had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted to heaven, shall be thrust down to hell. Jesus specifically names three cities, Chorazin, Bethsaida, or Bethsaida, and Capernaum. All three of these were in the realm of hearing Jesus' teaching. Jesus spent much of his ministry, many of his days at Capernaum. But Jesus pronounces a woe to them because ultimately they had rejected him. I want to skip over here to my notes for just a moment. David Jeremiah said this. Historically, all three cities fell into ruin. The destruction of Chorazin was so complete that archaeologists still do not know where it was located. In verse 16, Jesus says, He that heareth you, heareth me. And he that despiseth you, despiseth me. And he that despiseth me, despiseth him that sent me. David Guzik says in his commentary, as he sent his 70 disciples with the anticipation that some would reject them, Jesus also encouraged them with the thought that they were his representatives and should not take their rejection or acceptance to personally. Truly, their greatest concern should not be with success or with rejection, but with properly representation of their master. As we come to verse 17, we find the joy that the 70 come and announce to Jesus that they have. Obviously, perhaps they, some of them had met up with some rejection. But rather than looking for the negative, they accentuate the positive. 
It says in verse 17, And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Now, I mentioned a little earlier that this was one thing that Jesus had not given them specifically. He didn't, he didn't name them, uh, didn't name it to the 70 that they would be able to cast out demons or be able to overcome uh, evil. He simply told them to go, to pray, and to go. To go in and where you're received, and to spend some time, and to leave where you're rejected, and shake the dust off your feet. But they had seen evidently some success over demonic forces or perhaps even physical demons that they had met along the way. But they also pointed out the fact that they were able to overcome the demons or evil through the power of Jesus' name. And Jesus says, in verse 18, it says, And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Was Jesus there when Satan was judged and he and a third of the angels were kicked out of heaven? Absolutely. Absolutely. Jesus points out for us in this passage how sudden it was. How rapidly it took place. I want you to notice this, and I like what Charles Spurgeon says in regards. Remember, Jesus had told him, I, <coughs> Go your ways, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. And the seventy returned with joy in their heart. Charles Spurgeon says that not one of the lambs had been eaten by the wolves. Not one of the lambs had been eaten by the wolves. H.B. Meyer says in regards to verse 17, he says to be sure not to rely not on numbers or organization, but on the name of Jesus. Use not as a charm, but as representing his living and ascended might. Verse 19, Jesus says, Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. John MacArthur says that the reference to scorpions and serpents perhaps is a figurative statement. Ultimately, as Jesus is telling the 70, that if you'll just rely on me, if you'll rely on God, if you'll do what we say, go where we tell you to go, preach what we tell you to preach, then yes, the demons are going to be subject to you. Yes, there will be no harm to come to you. You may meet up with rejection, but in one place, but you're going to be accepted in another. In verse 20, it says, Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. There's something about knowing that we will spend an eternity in heaven that should bring jubilation to our heart. Jesus said, he ultimately tells the 70, listen, don't, re don't rejoice in success. Rejoice in the peace of heart, peace in your heart that you have because you are a child of God. It wasn't wrong for them to rejoice in the success of their service. <clears throat> but Jesus was telling them there's a greater joy, a greater success. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said that 
He did not mean in the present instance to censure their joy and their success, but only to make it subordinate to another rejoicing, to prevent its growing to excess. I'm going to stop right there and uh, we'll uh, pick up on verse 21, Lord willing, next week. Remember what Jesus did to the, to the 70, the same thing he did to the 12. He called them, he commissioned them, he instructed them, and he sent them. <laughs> Along the way, he provided for them and he protected them. And so he'll do for us. Let's stand together. We'll have a word of prayer.